Hello dear ones, it's Alice. I'm of the stars and I had a little talking to do today about uh, feral children and feral humans. Uh, and I wanted to start with a, um, a seg segue of unconscious thought cloud of the world flow of thought uh, that begins with the, the word cachet or cachette, it's a French word. It means something like uh, something that has a ap certain appeal to it, a cachet or cachette. I think that's what it's called. I hope I got this right. <laughs> and so, but anyway, let's say um, you pick the, the pronunciation cachette for that word, that French word, and you're using cachette, for instance, with reference to the type of job that you like. It has a certain cachette, you say. Okay, so now I'm going to go through uh, this, this series of connections of images and metaphors in the unconscious mind. Cachette. Cash it. Cash box, a picture of a cash box. Cash it in, the idea that you're ready to die. Coffin which looks like a cash box, only larger, okay? So what you have is the word cachet, in this case applied to a profession, and the idea of death, all right? And I want to link that with the notion of feral children and feral humans in the world today. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> people think there, that there are no feral children in the world today and they wonder what would it be like if a child were raised by by an animal like in the story of Romulus and Remus right from ancient Rome where Romulus and Remus two children were raised by a she-wolf right there's that story there are also fictional accounts of people like Tarzan who were raised by was raised by it theoretically by an ape and how he fell in love with a, a woman who had come from a, a human family and tried to adapt to human ra ways right but in fact um, the people that fictionalize the uh, the actuality of feral children don't even have the slightest clue of what takes place in the human psyche when a child is is denied the opportunity to bond with its mother and with the notion of family life. And I thought that is what I'm here to talk to you a little bit about today, okay? In psychology, people are coming and working their ways backwards from certain um, motivational uh, constellations and uh, um, out behaviors that they see in, 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 in segments of the population and they're kind of working their way into an understanding of this type of personality but they haven't totally connected it I feel with the notion of the feral child and the feral human. Um, some of the categories they use are uh, antisocial personality, serial killer, is a ramification of antisocial personality and mass murderer is another. Some of the occupations that an antisocial personality might choose because of their constellation of, um, of motivating factors and because of their the way that they piece together reality lacking a certain um, very important fundamental of, of bonding and family life um, some of the occupations they might choose are con artist um, or uh, a dope peddler or um, um, a sex worker, for instance. And many other professions are suitable or suited to a person who is, was a feral child. And 
and the reason for this, as I understand it from reading Wikipedia on the topic, <laughs> is that uh, some of the qualities they have are risk-taking. Maybe you could consider they didn't have a mom to tell them not to take that risk, you know, not to explain to them the pros and cons of risks. So risk-taking is one uh, factor in the constellation of personality characteristics of uh, antisocial personality or feral child. Another is the idea that they um, that they will succeed no matter what. You know that they uh, in, they will they that own, are the only person who will beat the odds and like for instance they could be a gambler and they could think that, that they would always beat the odds no matter what the outcome they would always think that and the reason for that I think is that uh, lacking that bonding instinct they don't have like a relative sense of other people they don't they, for them the, the, the constellation of their universe is only they. It is only they. Everybody else in their universe is um, is like a building block in their um, picture of reality. Not a human being, as in as bonding creates, like a concept that someone else is like the mother or the family, the siblings, the father that these people are people and not just like an inanimate object that you use to construct or improve your universe, you see. But for the antisocial personality who has had no childhood, who's missing this very important fundamental of childhood learning, everybody that they see is uh, is just uh, like furniture or ornaments with which they create the beautiful picture of their reality. The suffering of another person means nothing whatsoever to them. They've never learned that lesson about, um, you know, in kindergarten when children learn uh, they're playing in the sandbox, right, or playing in the kindergarten and the teacher is watching and they hit a child, okay, and that child starts crying and they start laughing. You've seen that, right? All children go through this learning process. And uh, generally, a push comes to shove, and the teacher gives the child that slapped or bit the other child a little slap or a stern reprimand, something that makes that child cry and realize that the suffering of someone else is related to his or her own suffering, okay? But the feral child never learns this. They grow up in an environment similar to that of the pack animal, uh, say the pack of wolves or the pack of um, apes like that, right? Well, apes are the exception to the rule because there's, um, there's, there is bonding and compassion, but in the, in the wolf pack, and some, uh, you know, also in amongst wolves, but the overriding principle in, amongst wild animals, most wild animals, not primates, is, uh, is predator-prey relationship. And that is a relationship that the feral child falls into in very early childhood, generally speaking. Being on the streets, being out, um, relating really only to an animal or to people who are like animals. You see, you see how it happens, yeah. So in occupations, to get back to this, this uh, series of uh, Satchet um, uh, unconscious links, the thing of it is, an antisocial personality will pick an occupation that has what you might call Satchet. And by Satchet, I mean, the odor of death about it, death of others, and death of oneself. For instance, if an antisocial personality, a feral child, takes up sex work and contracts HIV, right, then that, um, 
the characteristics of that person actually are able to delight in the idea of transmitting disease and death to other people. And here's another characteristic of the feral child. They will always believe that someone else is responsible for everything that they do and that it's ever someone else's fault. There, there never was a person in their life that explained to them the idea of free will and the idea that, that they as a person have uh, responsibility for the decisions that they make. This is another childhood learning process that, that, is, that can't take place because they, they were never in the presence of a parent figure that was able to explain it during those critical first few years of life. So, when an antisocial personality who is a sex worker, and I'm not saying that all sex workers are antisocial personalities at all, merely that, uh, that a, what the psychologists call an antisocial personality. I choose such an occupation because of, because of the way that it reflects their own motives and personality, yeah. So in this case of the feral child who becomes a sex worker, should that child contract HIV, for instance, he or she would believe that it is the fault of, of other people that this happened. And, you know, there are a lot of people who aren't antisocial personalities who have trouble taking responsibility for their actions, so there's that too. But in the antisocial personality, this is carried to great extremes. For instance, there might be a case of an antisocial personality who has um, not knowing any different, not ever feeling compassion and not understanding that other people suffer or that it matters that they suffer, might have killed any number of people and, and might not feel that he, in the, at all that he is responsible or she is responsible for this behavior and would feel no qualms whatsoever about picking someone else some other acquaintance and arranging things in such a way that that other acquaintance is blamed for all those killings. This is quite common for the feral child who becomes a feral uh, adult human. And in fact, they may be so aware of that, um, of that quality that they might have lined up somehow in their uh, living arrangements, a number of people who, uh, through their social mask, they've been able to convince that they are normal or, per, per, and in most cases, extraordinary people who, um, who deserve respect and loyalty according to the way that humans do, right? And these very people are the ones that they would ch choose to quote unquote and aptly quoted, throw to the wolves in the event they are caught in antisocial behaviors. Yeah. Another characteristic of the feral child and the feral human is lying. And uh, by that I don't mean the occasional white lie. I mean that uh, in the subconscious mind that I hear in the Claire chatter, they're almost, almost everything that they say is, is a lie and, and a misdirection, uh, an attempt to reference people who hear the Claire chatter to other people uh, and, and to redirect the conversation away from them be because they know from experience that their thought processes are, are different from those of, of other human beings. And so they know that if, if a person actually logs on to their thought processes and if they don't lie, that that, 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 that person will understand what's going on with them. Uh, the lack of socialization that they have, the, the missing childhood learning. Um, but I have seen over and over again amongst those that they have conned into being uh, friends with them 
through manipulation of the other person's emotions, careful study of that and manipulation of that. I have seen that those who are loyal friends of theirs, when they do tell the truth, when they're asked a, a direct question, for instance, someone who's a loyal friend of an um, antisocial personality person might say, Dear heart, is it true that you sometimes kill people? And then with a total lack of like remorse or concern for the situation, uh, uh, like a lightness uh, or humor, that, that antisocial personality might respond, I do kill from time to time. And I've heard this over and over again on the internet, on the Claire Chatter plane. And, and then the friend, the loyal friend or follower will say, Oh my good Lord, no, tell me it isn't so. <laughs> and, and this has happened so many times that now I get very upset about it. I get very aggravated that a person could not understand what's being told to them, cannot conceive what's being told to them. And the fact of the matter is that this is counted upon by the antisocial personality. First, loyalty. First, the, the interplay of normal human emotions from this follower or friend. Okay, And then, statement of the truth in such a way that it's true to the antisocial personality who never feels remorse, whether or not he kills or does any sort of violent deed. He doesn't care at all. Okay, but, but the fact that he doesn't care, that he has no emotional affect around these, these things that are considered by society to be heinous crimes, is interpreted by the follower or the friend as, as a light joke, as a, as, a, as a statement that, of course, this could not be true. Okay? So what we have to do what we have to do when we analyze a person, when we see a personality and, and hear the Claire Chatter is recognize what's true emotionally and from that draw a picture of a personality that might be completely different from our own, you see. It might be worlds apart from our own and yet for that personality that is the truth of their reality. And we have to work with their motivational field, not ours. Not expect that interplay of, of bonding and love and family feeling or group feeling. Not expect, we have to expect the unexpected. Okay? So, so lying, constant lying, and a depth of social masks that you wouldn't expect normally. Most people have a social mask, you know, maybe one for church, <laughs> maybe one for the office, another one for their family, and then they have their own personal reflections and thoughts. But what with the ascension process happening, everybody is privy to everyone else's social masks and original genuine thoughts and feelings, you see. And so we're calling each other on that. So here comes the antisocial personality, the person that's never experienced any of this socialization process, and who's, what you would say, flying blind with his own theories through a reality that has to appear surrealistic, really, because everybody else is functioning by different rules. And this person is creating so many masks, one for every person, one for every situation, that when we hear the Claire chatter, we have to listen back a depth. We have to listen far behind the masks. We have to listen down deep. And the farther down we get into the, into the lower triangle, the first three chakras, navel point and below, as we listen to the other person through empathy, the closer we will get to the truth of that person's reality, which is functional mainly in the lower chakras and through the cerebral cortex, you see. This process of discovering the very deepest subconscious mind is something that we all undertake on our ascension journey. As soon as we have mastered a certain level of clearing in our own electromagnetic field, I, 
I urge you all to look into this when, you, when the opportunity arises because it reveals the kind of thing that most people cannot, can never, so far, have never been able to see. It, the basic fundaments, the, the, um, the feral instincts, the animal instincts, the, the early uh, human uh, subtypes that were almost, be, be, what do you call it, bestial, as, as humanity rose out of the depths of, of the animal realm where there's only just one group soul for each type of animal into the concept of individuation at that borderline there. At that borderline, there are amazing discoveries to be made and clearing work to do for all humankind. Ha! Huh. So, to get back on topic. <laughs> so, lying, many social masks, and the sacrifice of other people who are considered not really real people, um, not really like oneself, the sacrifice of others in, in the event that antisocial behavior is discovered and by la laying blame upon them, okay, instead of upon oneself. <laughs> so it would behoove an antisocial personality to develop, for instance, a following of people that, that he or she has convinced uh, that he or she is uh, an extraordinarily wonderful human being. And, in, and along these lines, in this context, fall some personalities like the Charles Manson uh, personality and other personalities who lead uh, groups or cults of, I have followings. Uh, I saw one on TV the other day. It was some guy in the central United States. He stuck to small towns. It was like a reenactment of his life. And he was the most personable guy. He was a wonderfully charming, charismatic person who had his followers, many of which were children, women with children, uh, whom he had, you know, taken liberties with. Um, and these people he had convinced that he had many wonderful supernatural powers and that he was like a prophet or a saint, you know. There's, they were completely hoodwinked by him. Another time I'll go into how this happens because it's a very arcane and complicated science uh, that involves, well, briefly, careful study of mind control, careful study of normal human responses and, and emotions so that these can be played upon like a person plays upon a piano. And in fact, that's, that's how it's considered to be. The other humans are considered to be uh, like like musical instruments that 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 the um, antisocial personality can get to play certain tunes by uh, by adjusting the strings by uh, by manipulating the strings of their emotions and minds. So that's briefly it, although I'll go into greater detail, I feel, in a, in a, in a future blog. So in this way, for instance, the Charles Manson personality could, could create a, a following of people that, that, you know, devoutly believed in him even after they were all incarcerated and, and sentenced to long terms in prison. Uh, still, you know, they believed in him. Uh, I believe I, I saw an interview with some, some of them after they were in prison. I don't know, was it a video or just a newspaper account? Uh, to, the, to that very effect, that they still believed in him completely. Then I saw the television documentary about this person from the Midwest who had done all kinds of things like he had killed, uh, apparently arranged the killings of a bunch of his, his followers in his house, it's cult and like that. But the people were um, that followed him, his cult were, it seemed from the TV documentary that, that the, the main emotions they felt were, uh, you know, that hoodwinked thing, that charismatically carried away thing that he could do whatever he wanted because he was so very special. 
the second thing that they felt was very abject fear at the idea of trying to go against his will and of trying to escape from that situation. So and I, t I, t I tend to think that those two um, feelings are, are hallmarks of people who are trapped in a situation of being with an antisocial personality or a feral child, feral adult person. It could be that this is because the drives that are being activated and uh, the buttons that are being pushed by the feral personality are to do with pack animal behavior, which is a very deep, deep subconscious um, layer of our, um, of our, I don't know, newospheric essence. The reason they're so repressed is because much of the teachings that we learn in childhood go against pack behavior. For instance, the idea that the strong can overcome the weak and kill the weak is, is modified by the socializing aspect of early childhood learning, you see. And so when a person uh, lacks this socialization intermediate like layer of, of modulation, of the primal drives, of the feral drives, then that is a pretty scary situation. And further very scary because they're so darned good at con concealing that. They're so and they must be, or they would never survive. I think this very primal feeling of fear amongst cult followers has to do with the fact that the antisocial personality, who is a cult leader, um, consciously accesses the the feral instincts of, of of his followers, and by this I mean accesses the the fear of being um, controlled and the and through his own desire to dominate and control accesses the sexual instincts uh, through his desire to rape and accesses the the fear of death uh, because through his desire to kill and injure and so when these like primal cords are struck in the cult followers of antisocial personality leaders um, the the followers who have socialization training aren't able to access this very deep uh, feral uh, process be, uh, because they have a layer of socialization, mental learning and socialization that covers up and represses those feelings, okay? And um, the leader, the ASP personality or antisocial personality is operating on those principles without the layer in between. And so he directly accesses that in, in his followers and in other people and creates in them this terrible fear, terrible fear of death, terrible fear of being raped, and terrible fear of being, uh, con of being controlled. Further, and just as an aside, I learned today uh, something about this, so, the socialization process that represses the feral instincts. The, uh, it occurs in, like, um, in different people, uh, in different like it's modulations. So some people, for instance, who are socialized uh, are slightly less socialized, okay? And these people occasionally, they're not antisocial personalities, but occasionally they might give in to the instinct to kill others. And yet, sexually, sex response is another feral instinct, sexually they're much less inhibited, much more able to enjoy the act of sex, right? And then, of course this is not to do with this topic, but it's interesting nevertheless. And then there are people who are slightly more socialized with regard to repression of feral instincts. And these people never have a problem with the, with the instinct of killing. They would never even think of killing, but yet their trouble might be 
to more fully express themselves sexually. So we have uh, like modulations of the uh, social repression of the feral instincts. But in the case of the cult leader who is an antisocial personality, who has normal socialized um, followers, we have the diametric extremes, okay? We have a person who has no, no socialization learning with regard to repressing the feral instincts and followers who have a normal amount of that. All right, and this, this is what gives him the ability to control their minds and control their feelings because, because he's dealing on a completely different level of the mind. That's my thought. It's a theory. <laughs> and to continue. <laughs>
light, love, and joy at each of those three points. And what I found is that it immediately pulled my energy down into a very grounded state where I was then able to concentrate on my heart much better. So a couple of new things to try. More perhaps on feral children a little later. But if you think in the meantime about the difference between a feral cat's behavior and the behavior of a cat that was raised in the presence of humans, you'll get a better idea about how it is for people who are missing the fundamentals of early childhood socialization training. Well, y'all take care. God bless y'all. Keep you safe in his love and light. Till next we meet.